Hey guys, we are back with some more nutrition information. Thank you so much for all the feedback that we're getting. Thank you for submitting questions to us so that we can help you on your health journey as you try to wade through all the diet information out there. I really want to encourage you that here at Hoppe, we believe that nutrition is much more simple and I hope that you feel like each time we do one of these, we are kind of bringing you back to the basics of thinking through things in a more natural way uh, to figure out what information is really important to you. And so today we're gonna tackle a pretty cool topic. I guess I should mention that Rix is with me today. He does not want to be away from me. So he's gonna help us on this little talk. Um, but today we're gonna tackle the topic of gluten. Uh, this is a real big buzzword right now. Everybody's gluten free. And um, so we kind of wanna know what is gluten, first of all? Um, why is it suddenly the evil food? Because there's always got to be an evil food. It's fat, it's carbs, it's, I saw bananas for a while. Everybody was picking on the banana. So now everybody's picking on gluten. And why is that? And, and, and how can you figure out if you should be one of those people hopping on the gluten-free train? So first of all, it's important to know what gluten is. And gluten is actually a mixture of proteins that's present in several grains, um, specifically wheat, but there's actually a whole list of them. You should look up that list if you decide you're gonna try to go gluten-free um, because you're just wasting your effort if you don't really go gluten-free. And there's quite a few grains that have gluten in them. Um, the gluten is responsible for the elasticity. It kind of works to gum things up and hold things together and give that great texture that you're used to seeing in bread. Um, granted, gluten is also present, I should mention, in crackers, pastas, um, some grains, just grain, like wheat berries would have gluten in them. Uh, so even though it's a whole grain uh, in its full form, it would still have gluten present. Okay, so gluten can create a problem for quite a few people, and we're going to kind of go on to talk about who that is, how you know if that's you. but. Um, everybody's automatically kind of jumping on the gluten-free train. And so I think it's important to talk about flours, okay? So first of all, when something is gluten-free, they've subbed out the wheat flour for um, a rice flour, a brown rice flour, a tapioca starch, which would be made from the yucca plant, maybe an almond flour or a coconut flour. There's a million flours, garbanzo flour, sorghum flour. All these flours are gluten-free. and what they are is just whatever that food is that the flour is made from is dehydrated down and ground up and it is um, substituted. Often you have to do quite a mixture to create the same texture and the texture can be off a lot of times on gluten-free products. So flours in general are um, something that I think that you should take heed to. So what I always explain to people is that the more steps it is from its natural state, uh, the more it should bring concern. So let's take the case of wheat flour. If you were out walking and you were starving to death um, and you came upon a wheat field, you wouldn't drop to your knees and praise God and be like, I found food, right? It just looks like grass. Chances are good you're not gonna sit there and nibble on the wheat. But then we process it and bleach it and turn it into a flour and suddenly you eat a crap ton of it. Okay, so the same is kind of true with these other flours. Although generally speaking, you might eat that product, like you might eat garbanzo beans or coconut or rice or um, almond uh, in, its, in its full state, unlike wheat. But the problem with grinding it up and making a flour is that you've done part of the digestive process already. So foods are meant to be eaten whole because they work with the body in a whole way. Um, the chewing is important, the breaking down, starting in the mouth with the saliva, then moving to the stomach, then moving down into the digestive tract. Those steps are important, which is why whole foods are so important for your body. Your body is designed to work with whole foods. It was never designed to work with flowers. So flowers are already um, pre-digested sort of for you. So they're not gonna work to be as filling or um, as, uh, nutritious as the whole food would be. So in the case of like traditional breads, I think it's important to know traditional breads and heirloom grains looked a lot different than what we eat now. So originally wheat was quite different. Um, the, the little head, the top part that looks sort of 
furry, I guess, <laughs> was much shorter. The whole plant was much shorter. You didn't uh, get as much from it, which inevitably would mean you didn't eat as much of it. Um, these grains are also bred down now to um, be higher in sugars and starches and carbohydrate content. So uh, that's really important because it's unnaturally boosting the carbohydrate content. Additionally, um, grains would have been harvested and processed quite differently with a stone. They wouldn't have been as processed and broken down and pre-digested as they are today. Wheat would never have been bleached. Um, the process by which we harvest the grains is quite different. There's a lot of questions as far as um, the use of Roundup, the use of um, GMO seeds and stuff like that in wheat. I think those are worth talking about, but I don't even think you have to get that deep into the conversation to just look at it and see that flour is quite far from the original plant, any flour. So by default, you should likely avoid most flours, regardless of if they're gluten-free or not. It should be a, a very small part of your diet. So I don't even care if it's coconut flour. You should be eating coconut, not coconut flour, more often. Okay, it's also important to understand that traditionally, breads would have been fermented. So a sourdough bread is a traditional bread, and in this process, the, there would not have been um, a cultivated yeast that you buy from the grocery store to make bread. Instead, you would have had to grow yeast, and the process of doing that involves fermentation. So the bread would take a full seven days to reach that fermented state, which would allow that rising to happen because natural wild yeast would be present in the dough. In that fermentation process, those positive bacteria, those probiotics and prebiotics would have digested the flour um, and done the work for you. So all those parts of the flour that are hard for our bodies to digest, because think about that original wheat plant, it's a grass, we would never go around eating that. So we know that since that's not something we would eat, it's gonna be a little difficult for our bodies to process it, which is why we have to break it down into flour to process it. But in, um, in a traditional sourdough bread, the bacteria would have done some of that processing for you. So many people who are gluten intolerant can handle a traditional sourdough bread made from wheat, not a gluten-free one, but made from wheat because of the enzymatic processes and the pre-digestion that happens because of the bacteria in that culture. Okay, it's important also to know that any of your gluten-free products, if you went one-to-one -one with them, a gluten-free cookie, uh, compared to a regular cookie, gluten-free pasta compared to a regular pasta, the glycemic index, which means how it affects your blood sugar, is going to be higher in the gluten-free product than in the glutinous product. So that's really important for people who are super hypersensitive as far as blood sugar, um, people who are diabetic, um, uh, people, just anyone who has issues with blood sugar in general, it's important to note that if you're eating a gluten-free alternative, you're automatically eating a higher glycemic load. The exception to that would be um, coconut flour and almond flour, but like your rice flours, your bean flours, um, I'm trying to think of some others, your tapioca flours, all of those are gonna have a higher glycemic index than a traditional wheat flour. Um, so, and now that we have all that background information, should you be gluten-free? So we believe here at Hakka that um, first of all, there's, there's no reason that you need to eat wheat. Wheat doesn't provide for you, or glutinous grains, let's just say glutinous grains, do not provide for you any nutrient that you can't get elsewhere in a better form to begin with. Additionally, many of your glutinous grains, we consume them in a very processed way. We are always telling you the less processed your food is, the better it is for you. So that automatically eliminates a lot of glutinous products like pastas, breads, crackers, goldfish crackers, things like that. Additionally, many people are actually gluten intolerant. Um, they just don't know it. So to know if you are gluten intolerant, you would need to do an elimination for about 30 days, um, no gluten whatsoever, and then reintroduce it um, at a high amount on that reintroduction day. So have it multiple times within the first half of the day. You will know immediately if you should not be consuming gluten. 
If you were to do that challenge and reintroduction and have no ill effects, gluten is not a problem for you. Now, should you eat it? Well, it depends on how you're eating it. If you're eating it as a whole grain, a wheat berry, um, a farro, something like that, sure. But if you're eating it in the case of a flour, that should always be, whether it's gluten-free or glutinous, anything that is processed or baked like that should always be a sometimes food, not a daily food. Okay, so hopefully that helps you understand a little bit more about gluten. We don't think it's quite the devil that everybody else does, but with that said, we consume it only in a traditional uh, form, and we try to make it come from heirloom grains. You can order flowers online that actually come from heirloom grains rather than the new modern wheat. Um, so, but again, that's still an occasional food, which traditionally, since it takes seven days to grow the culture, you probably wouldn't have it nearly as much. So anyways, I hope that helps you kind of bring it back to the basics, really weed through all the hype about it. Um, Bricks wasn't much help, he's sleeping, but I uh, hope you enjoyed this video and please keep submitting your questions. Remember that on our website, pocketfitness.net, you can go to the resources up in the left-hand corner and you can see all of our talks, exercise videos, forum videos, stuff like that. Uh, we'd love for you to come and take advantage of the knowledge that we're putting out. See you guys, have a great day.